Hey there guys, this is our second video here for week one. I wanted to continue with the process of actually doing the introduction to the particles, we'll call that Particles 101 video, as well as getting with our particle tutorial, which is uh, made available. Obviously the candle flames in there. There's also some other tutorials included in there. It's quite an old uh, PDF that I created, I think it's back in 2011, but I'll go through that step by step to see what changes are different. Because, of course, since 2011, it's been 10 years, and Maya looks just a little bit different. If you want to continue here, you can also see I also created a few more other tutorials, working with fire effect, working with particles, i.e. blobby particles in Maya, just for introduction. To... I do this each week because, again, remember, I'm looking for more than just the candle flame, more than just the in-class candle flame, more than just the in-class raining of arrow particles assignments, but I'm also looking for, before the end of the, the quarter, two additional uses of dynamic particles inside of Maya. Here you can see the simple example of what the uh, project actually sums up as. Using Maya's legacy particles, students are going to create a candle and flame effect. Length of animation should not be li should be limited to only about 10 seconds. Remember, we're not making masterpieces here, and it is very, very taxing on your computer to do this dynamic simulation. So. We keep these things very small. It needs to be a 1920-1080 as the final result. And again, uploaded, uploaded to the bright space if you click on this. It actually shows you some examples even. See, and you've got two examples here that you can see what people have done with this assignment in the past. All right, so getting started here, just to go about some Particles 101, I'm gonna go ahead and launch Maya. Again, this is what it looks like when you officially launch it as just Maya. Now again, remember, we have a timeline to expand here, meaning it's a full 200 frames. Now if I said 10 seconds maximum at 24 frames per second right here, then obviously this would be 240 frames to equate to 10 seconds. So it's kind of just something to get started here just to know about your actual desktop mode or your interface. Now, the last video I explained that one of the things we want to do, of course, is set project into our project folder. Well, I already did that in the last video, which means all I have to do now is set project, find the candle project where I placed it, go to the scenes file, and hit set. My bad. I went too deep. Oh well, let's just set project to candle project. That's all we needed to do. There we go. Which means now I can open my scene which is the candle assignment under scenes and not save the original that's there. And here we are in the previous file that I created. Now, as far as particles are concerned, particles are interesting in the sense that they live inside of the FX window. And they're actually here under the N particles. Now, all these on top, create emitter, all these things up top, even down to the editor here, all this are N particles. We don't want to play with end particles just yet. End particles, there's tons of tutorials out there that get the detail, but before we understand N or what's called nucleic particles, just like there's N cloth, which is N nucleic cloth, we want to understand the legacy particles. These are old school Maya particles, which you have saw in all those old films back in the day. And you can see what we get here. We get create emitter, create springs, emit from object, make collide, particle tool, and soft body. So these are the ones we're going to be playing with here in these first few tutorials. And just to show you what you can do is never just hit the button. Always hit the option box. So if, for example, if I want to create an emitter, I can hit that button here. I can give it an emitter name. And you see we have several emitter types, omni, directional, and volume based. Well, the best way to sum up what these do, these emitter types, is they're very similar to the way that lights work, meaning you have an omni light that gives off light in all directions, so it's kind of a spherical, right? You have directional, just like you have directional light, which points light, or in this case, points particles in one specific direction. And then we have volume-based, which means that it can be based on a sphere, a cube, a cone, a torus, and several other volumes. Okay, we're not going to play around with volume or direction or omni right now, but just to show you as an example that when we create something, I'll create a directional here. And then we have particles per second. This is the rate as in how many particles are being emitted 
for every second. And as you see, the default is set to 100. There's some other options here. For example, we can come in here and choose distance, max distance, minimum distance. That basically says they can start at a certain point and end at another point. They can go in specific directions. So you see the default is actually going to emit particles in the X direction, which is one. If we wanted particles to go straight up, like eventually we're going to do with our candle flame, we would actually turn X to zero and turn direction Y to one. And then directional also has a spread. So instead of all of our particles being emitted in one straight line, we can spread them apart. Think of a hose. Then we get elements of speed and speed random so that they are more, not, remember, random is based in nature. That's what makes these particles look realistic with their behavior and their performance. So we oftentimes want to add randomness. And then we have some volume types and some volume speeds, which again is getting a little more advanced than we really need to worry about right now. So just to show you here, I'm just gonna go with this first emitter and hit create. And you see it gives me this little green object here. I can scale it up probably. Let's see if it lets me scale up my emitter. Now I'm working at a computer here that's got a very low resolution to it all. So if I really wanted to change these, I could actually go into my, you know, my settings and preferences and change the size of a lot of these uh, things. I'll get to that later as far as customizing and making these, you know, handles actually have a little bit larger. In fact, I could probably double click here. Access orientation. Let's see, trend, common selection. Yeah, I'll get... I'll get to this in a later date here as far as how to actually increase the size of this so you can see what it actually looks like. But what this emitter does now, let me zoom in just a little bit more, that if I hit play, you're going to see that this is emitting particles. Let's see, I'm trying to make it be a little bit larger here. Watch, I can actually go to the particle tool here and check and see under the size here of points, we could go temporary to spheres or something like that. And now you can see that it is actually emitting particles. Remember, it's emitting particles in the X direction. If I go back to the emitter, I can change that direction, maybe X to zero and Y to one. And you see now I'm emitting them upwards. If I add a little spread, I can spread them out. I can change the speed and the speed random. And go back to my particle shape here, current render type. Oh, it wants me to pause it. Particle shape. You see I get a radius here, so let's just knock this down to a little slightly smaller. 0.25. And now you see if I play it back, we get our particles actually emitting with the spread in the proper direction, right? They're emitting in the positive y axis. And if we were to even come back to our emitter right here, we can play around, like I said, double the speed, put in some speed random. And you see now we're emitting just these little spheres as particles. So sometimes it's easier to kind of like set the size of things so you can see it before we go into. So remember, we're looking for performance first, then we're looking for appearance, and then we can worry about things like lighting and texturing and so on. So let's say example here, I've got this, let me boost that speed up a little bit more. Now, in addition to creating the particles, you can see these are pretty much living forever. We can change lifespan, max direction, all these different attributes can be adjusted for these particles. And when we get into the tutorial of the actual uh, candle flame, you'll see it actually makes sense. Something else we can add to particles, however, is we can come up here to what's called the field solvers. This is where we have all of our real world effects, gravity, wind, turbulence. So watch what happens if I add turbulence with the particle selected and I rewind and hit play, you see now they actually go more random because of the magnitude of turbulence. I'm gonna undo and take off that turbulence. Okay, so I got 
rid of the turbulence. And one more undo. Okay. So what else can we do with this? Well, let's go back to those field solvers and look at this real, you know. So again, if I wanted to make maybe look this like a like a, a, a water fountain or something, obviously I would need to add gravity to it. So with the particles selected, and you can see I can take these fields like this gravity and move it out of the way here. And what is the gravity? It's the de default real world gravity force of 9.8 in a negative y direction, which is exactly what gravity does. And now you see, instead of shooting into the air, they're falling. Now, if I want that to really look like a fountain instead of like a bubbling, you know, uh, a brook, let's go back to our emitter and let's increase the speed even more. And as you do that, these are going to try and work against the gravity. Okay, and you see now how that is essentially working. I'm going to move that up a little bit here so it's actually starting and emitting up off the, the plane. See that? And there's just a lot of really neat things here because even here, I can create like a plane. Right? And watch. Particle, shift, plane. And watch what I can do with this. Let's go to those field solvers. And I'm going to look for make collide. It's probably here. See? Make collide. And now if I rewind and hit play, the particles now are going to collide with that ground plane and bounce off. And what's cool about that is because it's got this thing called a geo connector, that is the G geometry connector between the particles and the plane, and you see I get things like resilience. Well, resilience is bounce. So if I say less resilience, and I say more friction, now instead of bouncing off that ground plane, watch what happens. Now they're kind of sticking to it. So particles have an incredible amount of, you know, uh, ability and, and, and just strength just here inside of our good old-fashioned Maya. It's really an impressive software. All right, so let's actually get into this candle flame tutorial here. Let me go ahead, delete everything. And if you haven't seen it yet, check out the little tutorial. Like I said, I wrote this pretty easily. Um, it is quite old. So like I said, it's 10 years old already, but it actually gets to the meat and the potatoes of how to do this. And it kind of walks you through it. So as again, as with any project scene generated by it is always important to set project, create new project, if create a new scene, create a new project. And this is especially, like I said, because of the cache of the memory and where you save the scene and where all that data goes. So we get started here at the candle flame emitter, how to create a simple candle and flame. Now, I start here by simply building the set. All right, so what we're going to do is, we're, like I said, I don't want primitive objects. Those prim I don't really want cubes or spheres or anything performing in here. I'll take some exceptions, but I want things to actually demonstrate their dynamics and simulation. So that's why we're using a candle, and I have a simple tutorial on basically how to start it. Please read through it. I'm just going to skip ahead here and go right to Maya. Okay, and what I'm going to do here in Maya, of course, using our good old grid, is I'm just going to make a floor. Just something to look at here, right? And on top of that floor, I'll place a cube. Doesn't really have, now, scale has a lot to do here inside of Maya, but for all reasonable purposes here, I'm not going to get too fancy about scale and size. That is just because, again, it's going to be based upon the resolution of your computer screen. It's going to be based upon, you know, uh, other factors as far as the default sizes of things, because we're going to find that a lot of particles are really small because, again, Maya is based on centimeters. Now, some of you, if you've worked in Softimage or uh, Studio, 3D Studio Max, that's actually based in inches. So this grid, for example here, which is inside of Maya, is essentially 20 by 20 centimeters. And if you understand centimeters, it's actually quite small. So I started by just making a box on top of a ground plane, all right? Now, let's make our candle. To make our candle, I'm going to hit the space bar, and I'm going to switch to either a front or a side view. And this is simply because 
yeah, we can use a simple, stupid candle, just a cylinder, and then model it like old school polygon. But I like showing you guys even more and more and more kind of shortcuts to make certain things. So let me go back here to my modeling menu set again. And I'm going to go to Curve. Actually, I'll just go right here to Curves and Surfaces. And I want a CV curve, okay? Not the EP, but a CV curve. Or I could even go here to create Curve Tools CV Curve. And what I'm gonna do with the CV curve is I'm going to, to build my candle. I'm just gonna click, and if we hold X, it actually will snap to the grid. And I'm just gonna build a little tapered candle Need a sharper right corner there. Let's put, remember two clicks, sharp corners. One click, round corner. That's how a CV curve tool works. So if I move this out of the way, you see exactly what that is. Nothing too fancy about it. It's just it's just a curve. And if I were to look it back in my perspective view, you'd see exactly what it is, right? And what we're going to do with this curve? Let me stick here to the perspective view a second. What we're going to do is we're going to do what's called a revolve, okay? That is here in the surface. Revolve, option box. And we want to revolve around the y-axis, okay? We're going to use the object of the pivot to do a 360-degree revolve, okay? We can leave this eight segments, and we want to output as polygons. And something that's important to do when you output as polygons is to hit Quads, general, span, span. This is a way of actually using curves to create polygon modeling. Now, if I went with just the default, it would actually give me a NURB uh, uh, model, a non-uniform rational B-spline, and that does work because we're not really dynamically interacting with this candle. We just want it to look pretty. So I'm just going to hit the revolve here. And you see, it has revolved that candle. The problem, of course, is, is that you'll notice if I deselect, it's all blacked out. That is because the U's and the V's, or the normals, if you like, are reversed. All right, so what I made the problem here before, guys, is, is it's inside out, meaning the normals are facing in. So if I go to display, polygon, and say, show me the face normals, you notice you don't see them there because they're actually facing inward. So reversing that is mesh display, reverse, and you notice now suddenly, now it's visible, and if I click, you see these little green hairs, meaning that the normals are now officially facing outward. So I can come back to my display polygon and turn off my face normals. Because now our candle is back to where it was, go to my attribute editor and move it back down to its base, okay? And because we're done with this now, I can delete the history on this. Watch, edit, delete by type history, which allows me to go back to my curve and delete it. Okay, so we have a candle, okay? And we have ourselves our box, and this gets us back to where we were here, uh, going all the way down here. And of course, this one looks a little different, of course, because I used triangles instead of quads, which I, hey, it's fine. And now we're moving on down here, and now we're ready to create our emitter. All right, so following the dynamics menu set, so now again, back here in Maya, we need to switch back to the effects menu set. Okay, deselect. And again, I could even save Control S just to be safe right now. So now we need is to create an emitter. Now on the tutorial here, it says to create in the option box a directional of 100, changing it to the Y positive. Well, we saw that already in our prior video. So let's go ahead and do that. So again, under the end particle, under the legacies, create an emitter option box directional of 100, go to the distance, change it direction to positive 1 in the Y and 0 in the X. What else does it say here to do? 
Okay, well, let's see here. Uh, the spread value should be 0 0.3. So, spread value, 0 0.3. And we hit create. This is going to put our emitter, though, beneath our box and candle. So we're going to move it up until the emitter is just at the tip of the candle. Think about it. It's where the wick would be. Okay. We hit create. The emitter looks like a small circular icon. However, it has been placed at the origin 000. Move it upward on the y-axis until it lives just on top of the candle. If we hit play, we may not see real-time playback, and we may not see enough time for our particles to grow. So this is where I say change the frames to 300. Now I said we can do this with 240. 240 is just fine. So I'm going to rewind and hit play. And you can see these guys. Actually, they're barely visible here because they're kind of gray, and they're not, they're just point particles, but they're actually emitting in that direction. A cool way to see this is if I go to wireframe. And in wireframe, you're actually going to see it. See, now you see the particles emitting upward into the sky, living forever. So now we need to tell the particles how to behave. So, setting up the particles, okay? Select the particles and open the attribute editor. That's easily done with the control A. So I select my particles and I hit control A to launch the attribute editor. It's also up here in the upper right hand corner. And you see when I do that I got my particles, my particle shapes, my emitter, the texture for a hard particle, and time. Let's go to the particle shape. And you see we've got all these, we've got dynamic weight, we've got conserve, all this extra stuff we can play with here. But first we need to check our tutorial and it says particle shape set the lifespan mode to constant and a value of 2.5. All right, lifespan mode right here to constant and a lifespan of 2.5. Now you'll notice that our particles grow up, but you see how they stop growing forever, okay? Eventually they die. What's next? Well, under the render attribute, change the particle type to a cloud SW. Okay, moving on down here. Here we have render attributes, particle render, cloud SW. Now, you'll see immediately if I do that and hit play, I've got these very large clouds. Now I can zoom in. I can even switch to a five view again, because now you see this white cloud that's being emitted. The problem is, is that they're all, they don't have a proper shape to them all, right? It just looks like one big blob. Well, that is what cloud and blobby particles are meant to do. They cluster together to create more of a volume effect than an individual, individual particle. So what we need to do to adjust these is change the current render type. And you see this opens up some attributes. Now, if that doesn't happen, remember, you have to pause to get that to actually work. So what's next now? Okay. Under the Add Attributes 4, click the current render type and change the radius. Leave it at 1, but change the threshold to 0.3. Okay? So the radius is 1, but the threshold needs to be 0.3. Threshold, guys, is the hack that if you have, if you think about like a, a splash of water, it's a bunch of blobby particles that, but when they're together, they merge into a volume. So that's what threshold. Threshold means that these things can actually bond and blob together to form more of a volume. What else do we have here? Okay, point three. The particles, oops, the particles should now be seen as a cone-shaped cloud. However, the shape of the candle flame tapers into a tip. We must make the particle radius change over time. So again, it's basically saying is that we've got the shape of a cone right? But it doesn't quite look like the actual uh, uh, teardrop, right? Shape of a candle flame. Just like if you struck a lighter or a match or something like that, that has a specific shape. And so to get that shape, we're going to control the radius of each of these particles over time. This is done 
by adding a dynamic attribute underneath the per particle array attribute. So we're gonna basically click on the word general. We're gonna go to the top and choose particle tab. We're gonna click radius PP and hit okay. And this is gonna give us a script to basically control the radius of the per, uh, per particle over its lifetime using a gradient ramp. So let's do this. So again, I'm gonna come down until I get my array attributes. There is no radius per particle here, so I need to hit general, switch to the particle tab, scroll down and find the word radius per particle, hit okay. And this now gives us our radius PP option here. Now, I said we're gonna use an array map. We're gonna use a, a wrap, a ramp, to control the lifetime size. Whereas black represents zero and white represents one, as in one was the size of the radius that we wanted the maximum to be. If you would choose two or three as your radius size for a particle, you would actually need to go into your array mapper and tell it that it can go past one. So this is how we do it. With radius PP in the empty window next to it, we right click, create ramp, and you can see already, look at the difference already of it, see it? Right now, they're being born the size of one, but they're dying at a size of zero. Let's go ahead and look at what that ramp, right click, edit ramp, and you see it. they're being born white, and then they're slowly shrinking to a size of zero radius at their death. But in the tutorial, look at, mine's a little different here. I'm actually going black to white to gray to black, meaning I want them to be born with zero radius. You see, it's already changed a little bit. So I'm gonna move this here, that there, click here, and make that be black. So they're now going to be born. I'm also gonna turn this to be a smooth bump. Just right here, that means that it'll give me more of a smooth growth. Now when I hit play, they're being gonna be born zero radius, massively increase, to a value of one radius and then slowly back down to zero at their death. In fact, that's almost telling me right there that one is still a little too large. So let's go ahead and back this down to a little bit of gray and you have to pause. Let's see what this looks like now. And now you see we're starting to get that candle shape, okay? All right. That teardrop though needs something else. Now what causes a candle flame to actually have that shape to it, that teardrop shape, is that as the heat is growing, it's actually eating up oxygen at the top. And that means that we actually need some real world physics to help define our shape. Notice it's not gravity, it's not wind. We can always add some wind, which is pretty cool. But right now, we need to add a field called a Newton and the magnitude should be 12. So how do we do that? Select our particles and come up here to field solvers and add a Newton. A Newton, the best way to describe the physics of the Newton is it is a grand attractor. It is a black hole, okay? So by adding the Newton and then moving the Newton up to the tip of our candle flame and giving it a magnitude a little bit bigger, I think I said 13, what it's gonna do is attract those particles to that Newton, okay? And you can see, whoa, it's a little bit powerful. Maybe I need to back it off a little bit. You can see I can scrub through here and find a value to get it to attract. I kind of like it here, maybe about five instead of 13. So again, it's all gonna be based on scale. And now even I'm finding, you know what? My particle, my candle flame is, is enormous. So let's go ahead. If yours is too big, right? Go to that original particle shape of the radius of one and give it a lower value. There we go. 
still pretty big candle flame, but hey, not too bad. Remember, I could always scale up the candle in the base and it would look, it'll look better. Okay, switch back to the five. I'm gonna go ahead and throw a wireframe on here just so we can see. And there you see the performance of our candle flame. Now, some other things are going on here, okay? For one thing, adding color. The fact that if I go back to my candle flame, it's when I hit play, it's being born. What if I want my candle to be constantly already on fire? Well, that's coming here to fields and solvers and saying in the solver, see where I'm going to need to put this. I need to set the solver initial state. See this right here? Initial state of my solver I want to set now as the candle is already being on flame so that when I rewind to zero it stays in that position and I it's always on, right? So I don't have to start it and stop it and it doesn't have to, it doesn't look like it's being lit and taken off. It's already in the status of giving me candle flame. All right, let's put some color to this, okay? Adding color to the flame. And this is a combination of three different color channels we're gonna deal with. We're gonna deal with the actual color of our candle flame. We're gonna deal with the glow value and the incandescence and transparency too, because I don't know if you've ever noticed, but the candle at the base is very transparent. And it is important to remember that we, we will not see the color of our flame until we hit the six on the keyboard, right? That is show colors. Currently the flame appears as gray. However, if you render, you will see the flame appear blue. So let's see if we render here. What color is it gonna give us? Uh, well, we're actually seeing white because we're in the Arnold. This is where we could actually quickly just switch to Maya software and you see it's gonna give us a blue flame. That is because the base default texture color of particles is this blue. Very similar to the default color of all geometry is always gray because it's always assigned the default Lambert one. Don't ever change those. Leave Lambert one and leave particle cloud one shaders alone, right? Let's see if I close that down, you can see if I go into my materials list here, it's going to give me my particle cloud, the default particle cloud, see this, is a blue, see, for the particle cloud. So it's blue color. We don't want to use that. What we want to do is actually create a new particle cloud shader. So open the tab from the top called Initial Particle SE, and you're going to see the colors assigned to our particles by default. So let me minimize this, select this, oh, not Newton field, particle, and you're going to see particle cloud. And all the inputs here, and I'm looking for initial particle SE. See, it's, it's, it's basically Lambert 1, which is the gray Lambert of everything else. And that's what it would be colored if you were making something that is non-transparent, like if we were making, honestly, water, or if we were making liquid chocolate, or if we were making, you know, something that is a solid that's visible from the outside. Even though water is transparent, it's still a solid. It behaves as a solid, meaning the inside is may be transparent, but the outside is actually a texture, uh, as opposed to a cloud or, or, or a fire flame that is going to be solid towards the center and then as it goes to the outside of each particle it's going to have transparency and that is what a volume material is all about so what's our tutorial say we found that we already got the see we've already got our hyper shade open and the hyper shade pop up we must create and replace the volume material so we're going to go create volume material particle cloud and name it flame sg all right, so here's our hyper shade. Go ahead and get this a little bigger here. And we're going to create volumetric material, particle cloud, okay? And over here, we're gonna call it 
fire SG, meaning fire sheeting or flame SG would actually be better. Yeah, let's call it flame SG. Flame SG here in the name. Okay, and enter. So you see now we've made a new particle cloud SG and named it appropriately. Now we need to get into actually colorization of it all. You see it looks just like it here, okay? We're gonna assign this to the particles by selecting the particles and then right-clicking on Flame SG node in the hypershade and assign it. So, let me just minimize this out of the way a little bit. So, I'm gonna select my particles. In the volume material here, I'm going to right click on the flame SG and assign the material. And you'll actually see now if we select particles and we get to our actual flame SG is now loaded into our particle. Minimize that hypershade because I've got it here. Now it's time for color. Okay. Back to the attribute editor for flame SG. Click on the checkered box next to life color. Choose ramp. Okay, so not the color, but life color here. And we're gonna click this life color, choose ramp, and then we're gonna just go back a step two to get to the ramp that it assigned. Now, this is what's gonna be done. So you see the life color is basically gonna look like a candle flame. We're gonna do the same thing with life transparency and life incandescence. So let's do those all three here. So, life color, go to a red. Here we'll go to orange. Here we'll go to a yellow. So you see what we're getting there is just fire flame, right? It's being born, turning red, orange, yellow to white back step. That's life color. Life transparency. It's also going to get a ramp. Go back twice. And what's our life transparency? This is actually transparency is driven by white and black as well. Whereas white is transparent and black is solid. So we're going to follow this here. So again, we're going to say It's going to be born transparent. And then drift to. Does that, look, does that look good? Yeah, it looks pretty good. See that? Like so. Just like that. Go back two steps. Finally, life incandescence. Now, incandescence is also referred to as self illumination, meaning without even having lights in the scene, it will illuminate and give off the illusion of light. Not glow. Glow is different. And our self-illumination or life incandescence, you see, it has to be very dark because it's very sensitive to white values. You see it's going to be born black, dark red, dark yellow, basically back to black. So, black, dark red, dark yellow, okay, and back to black. Very simple. Some people will even put a little band here at the top that will represent like a little really intense light at the top but this is just fine to actually get that to work. Last but not least, we set the glow value to 0.4. So here's our glow intensity, 0.4. So now, remember, it's not gonna really show us here until we hit six on the keyboard, right? That actually shows, you know, textures and color, but you'll notice it's still not really showing us the color 
even though we've just assigned it. And the example I always give here is because we're dealing with particles and dynamics and, and software render particles. They only really show up, remember, if you see color here, it's typically because it's a hardware color. But if we're working with software colors, we have to render it. So let's just do a snapshot of our render. And there you see, look at that, we've got a candle flame. Now, we can make more adjustments to that if you wish, okay? But that's essentially the tutorial as I wrote. Now, you can see here, I've got this like hardware render particle waterfall tutorial as well that we can play with. It's just a, another example of working with hardware particles, um, you know, where you may have the, rain, the waterfall itself, then you may have mist, and then you may have foam and all this kind of stuff. I'm just going to close that tutorial down because there's a few other things we can play around with. Like I said, I have no lights in this scene right now. Okay? So I could come here, create lights. Now again, if I'm just going to render as a software, we could just create normal everyday lights. Especially if our candle here is going to be actually giving off a light. So that would of course be a point light if our candle is giving off the light. Let's move it up here, and I can then give it a little bit of a candle-y kind of color. Something in the orange range, something like that. And again, now if I render, you'll see I'm getting light in my scene, right? If I were to offset it, or if I were to, you know, play around with different textures in here, I could give those textures here. What if I want to actually introduce a little bit of wind? Well, that's going back to the effects, fields and solvers, right? And I could put air. And that air means I could come over here, place it where I want it to go. Now watch this cool little trick here. If I hit T on the keyboard, it gives me all of the air field or the, or the field controls, T. And here's where I can choose my magnitude, my attenuation, you can see if I swing around, I can get my direction, see? So right now the direction, I could say go that way with the wind, hit play, see? Maybe bring the magnitude down, okay? And I'm just playing with, and I can then go and keyframe these, right? enable some spread to this wind. I can add different special effects. You know, I could come in here and I could change, you know, for example, if we don't know, we should know by now how to play around with uh, keyframing. So at one, I could come here and right click, set a key for the magnitude, set a key for all three of the directions, turn on my auto keyer, okay? and then scrub through time and just move the direction, change the magnitude a little bit, come here, change the magnitude, change the direction, right? And give the illusion like this candle flame is actually being blown around a little bit. Watch now. Maybe I need some more zeros in here. All right, let's add some more zeros. adding some keyframes just to give some more dynamic animation to this candle flame, see? So again, you can actually interact with the world. It has a more natural, random movement to it all. All right, let me hit save a second. Just uh, save it, pause. All right, now, the only thing I haven't really done with this at all is change any of the, the shading values of my materials down below. Now. A quick shortcut way, guys, to do that is instead of creating uh, a Lambert that is the default, try adding a blend or a fong 
just because they have reflectability, I can leave it gray if I want. And I could select, let's say, select here our ground plane. Let's go ahead and assign them. Right click assign. Our candle, I could create another material here. Let's make a, I don't know, another blend. Select our candle, assign blend two, which I can even name candle, right? Go ahead and close our attribute there because now I can card to say, okay, well, I want my candle to be, I don't know, let's pick a color for it. You know, go with a light blue, okay? We want some incandescence, right? We want it to be a little transparent just so it acts like, you know, a little bit more like wax. And most importantly here is to activate ray trace. Same thing can be done with our blend we did here. Let's put a simple color to it instead of just gray. I'll just give it uh, a brown, something like that. Okay, let's come in here and say ray trace. And last but not least, I believe we still have to tell our particle color, which is our particle SE. Flame SG. And I believe we have to activate this. Let's see here, where would it be? So that it shows up in our rendering. I think it actually. Let's see. Lynn. Ah, it looks like it's okay. All right. So now if we hit a snapshot of our render, you're going to see, right? Our nice little candle flame blowing in the wind. Again, it's just a little bit much there with the wind, but remember, I wanna see a performance out of this. So what we're gonna to have to do now is go into our render settings, okay? Which is the render clacker. Okay. And we're looking for the render sequence. Launches the render setup editor, create layers collection, no runs, no. Display render settings, there we go. So it used to be a open clacker, now it's a clacker with a little settings tab. All right, now again, if you're gonna work in Arnold, you want it to work with Arnold, with Arnold lights. Right now, I'm just starting us off with software, okay? And some of the parameters we have to set up here for rendering, of course, is what is the name, okay? So let's just say last name, handle, right? Something like that. We need a format. Now there's lots of formats to do here. I could do AVIs, I could do JPEGs, I could do PSDs, you know, there's a QuickTime version of it all. The problem is, is rendering in Maya as a video file is very, very lengthy because it has to not only render every frame, but at the end, put it all together. Well, you guys should have enough experience in After Effects to render as a sequence, okay? And to render as a sequence, my favorite are targets because they are lossless quality, okay? They're a lossless quality, and you can put them in a zip file and make them nice and small. Next thing we need to change is, you see, name extension single frame? Nope. We want the very last option, name underscore number. Start frame one, end frame, 240. Right? We want 240 or maximum of 10 seconds. Now, you see down here, I currently only have 200, so for this case, I'll just put 200. Not that big of a deal. Moving on down, what am I rendering? I'm rendering my perspective camera. If you make a custom camera, you need to designate what camera you're going to render. Moving on down here, my image size, I want full 1280. No, not full 1280. I'm looking for 1920 1080, which is HD 1080. There we go, 1920 1080. Okay. There's even some render options here. Doesn't really give us much, but again, for some of you that dive with a fancier computer, you might have like a render farm. Now that I've set up the common area, common area, let's move to Maya software. Quality. Now you see the default is usually kind of low. 
But if I choose production quality, it's going to give me a much higher quality. And then I can come down to the ray tracing and turn that on. What is ray tracing? It means that because of the lights in the scene, I'm going to get not just shadows, but reflections because I chose a blend with mental ray reflections on. Okay, let's see, that looks good. I don't know, you can turn on motion blur. Remember, the more you set up here, the longer it's gonna take to render. Okay, so I'm just gonna hit close. fact watch this. I'm going to go ahead and create just to have it here a second spotlight. Just to have a second light. Right? Most scenarios require at least two point lighting if not more. This one I can have be a lot less intense. I'll give it the inverse color of the candle. What's the color of the candle? It's yellow light. So what color should be the shadows? A dark purpley color, like so. Meaning, this is more of my lighting, my shadow light value. So I could say purple gives off a dark yellow shadow, believe it or not, or a little more orange. And our spotlight, where are you at? Here's my light. Remember guys, great way to kind of get a hold of stuff is you can always open up some of these windows here. See, this outliner shows you where everything is. So I'm, now that's my spotlight. I'm actually looking for my point light. There it is right there, which is why I couldn't find it. And I can even tell my point light because it's giving a yellow. What is the complementary color of yellow is again, a dark purple. And so I can actually say that yellow light gives off purple shadow. Now, one last thing I can do here just before I render this is to go to the view camera settings and say use resolution gate this is going to show me exactly what is going to be rendered besides what I'm seeing on my screen watch this see and so now I can aim my shot of what I want to render just like that do one more test to see what it does I kind of like a little different angle here. You know what? I'm still not happy with my wind. Where's my airfield here? Let me go ahead and wherever I've got this at a massive number. I think somewhere I had it up at six or something like that. Turn those values down. Let's get that. There it is. Just too much wind. Right? Now we hit play. There we go. See? Just some gentle blowing in the wind. save one last time and now we're actually ready to render off our sequence now remember i'm doing a sequence because in after effects i'm going to put this together with my name on it it's what i expect you guys to do as well so i know who's what and this is going to be very helpful of course when you actually get to the world of uh, the final of actually building a demo reel all right so now all i need to do is render okay rendering render and I'm rendering as a software, so I'm just gonna batch render. Everything is set so far. Okay, looks like it wants me to allow axes. And you're gonna see the bottom down here, result rendering with Maya software. And that's actually rendering in the background, which is kind of neat and cool. Now you see it hasn't even really started yet, but it's gonna start rendering. And once it starts moving, it's gonna get pretty quickly. Rendering frame one, frame two, frame three, frame four. Now. Another way I can do this too, I'm actually going to hit four on the keyboard and highlight everything so it's a white wireframe. Okay? Because I could also do 
a simplified version of this without rendering in what's called a play blast. And that's here under Windows, play blast, option box. I'm gonna say time slider for the length, okay? Include the view. What format do I want this is? You see it only gives me AVI or image. I'm gonna say AVI, no encoding, high quality, from the window size, now from the render setting size, scale 101%, or full scale, right? Save to file, this is all important, and I'm gonna call this movie file candle assignment one, and maybe change this to be a wire frame, right? And double check where it's going. You're gonna see it's actually gonna go into the candle flame project movies. Handle assignment one wireframe. Now again, you don't have to do this, but this is how the Play Blast works. And the Play Blast actually records right here on screen. Okay, so it's actually chugging through and showing you the 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 RAM preview, right? The RAM preview of Maya simulating the animation in a wireframe without the lighting, you know, and it's enough to show the performance, you know, of what it's doing. So in the end, I've got my rendered sequence in the background, and I've got a low quality play blast version of my animated candle. And you can see here, it's gonna play it here. Okay, and you see it here now real time, showing off its performance. All right. So all that's left to get this assignment done now is to launch After Effects and put these together with your name. Now, I'll show you this this week, but again, in the future weeks, I'm expecting you guys to kind of understand when you build a project like this and you're submitting it, how to put it together. Because I'm actually going to use, even though I said maximum of 10 seconds, I don't need 10, actually I did 200 frames, so it's not quite 10. But what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to use the two versions of this over top of each other to show the before, or to show the final result, and then fade that away to show the wireframe, and then show the final result. So we launch After Effects. And by the way, guys, just a little FYI, if you want a preview, you can actually view the sequence that's rendering in the background. Here it is right here, to see what it looks like in the meantime. This looks like I need a little bit more light in here. You can't really see the box. But I'm just gonna again, I didn't I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on the rendering process, but you can play around with that and get some variations of it. But again, you can preview it there. Here's my After Effects new project. And what I'm gonna do is import my wireframe. So again, I gotta find my desktop, find my project folders, right? Right here, candle flame, candle project. Remember, it's saved in the movies folder, the wireframe. Let's go ahead and import that and drag that down to the base. Okay, and we've got that now. And you can hit the space bar, you can get it working for you there. And even though this is up and currently still rendering, I can start bringing in my Maya renders. Where are they going to go? They're going to be in the images folder. See? Here they come. So I can select it. Make sure you turn on the sequence button. If you don't, it'll only bring in one. We hit OK. And let me go ahead and drag this on top. Now, it's not done rendering, which is why you see it's only gotten this far. And it looks like it might have a little bit of a squeeze issue going on between the AVI and the Targa. Again, the cool thing about this is you can kind of pretty easily, you know, adjust for the, the, the lens squeeze of it all. Okay. Hey. 
even here just to make this look good and clean. Let's go ahead and new solid. Make it be that color. Put that on the bottom. Okay, just to kind of fill that in. But again, it's rendering in Maya in the background, which is why it's only gotten me 16 frames. But watch what I do. I right click on it and I hit reload. And you see now it has added more images. So while that's finishing rendering, you're, that, rendering guys is something you usually want to dedicate at night. You don't want to mess with it during the day because you're probably going to be working on projects. Just trying to line up my two versions here a little bit better. where we can add some important information here, right? Grab the text tool, put your name on it. Assignment one. Candle, flame, right? And any information you feel is important there, right? You can put AI, AI, what is the class, dynamics, and simulation. Anything that helps explain what's going on. Date. What software version were you in? And I'm just gonna drop that down, just like that. Let's double check our process on the renders. Reload. See it added quite a bit more frames. And if I hit the space bar, you can actually see how we're going to basically show that all off. reason I think my my play blast I may have adjusted or moved my camera by accident which is why they're not lining up perfectly but that's okay so again eventually what I'll do is when I get all this rendered I'll just take out a section of it here to show it fade away to reveal the wireframe and then come back to it last but not least it's just an issue now of sending it off to the media encoder and choosing the H.264 MPEG-4 compression type. That is the preferred format. I don't really want QuickTimes. I don't want, really want AVIs. Make sure, because the, they're, they're much, much larger than an H.264. And if you send off the media encoder, it will do that. So, in a nutshell, guys, that is it. Uh, that's loading up a second. Good luck with your candle flame. Uh, there are other resources naturally besides what I've gotten done here that actually you know, get more greater detail and whatnot, but that's about it. That's pretty much what I'm looking for there. And if uh, I will try it, like I said, and get the second video, which is going to be next week's Raining of Arrows, uh, uploaded as soon as possible. Thank you guys and good luck to you. Take care.